Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz, and we've got a good guest today. He is a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics at Harvard University, and he's vice president for research at Cato, and he's here today to talk to us about corporate taxation. Jeffrey Myron, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. What exactly is a corporation? Corporation is a form of business organization. A one extreme, one can think of businesses as being like a mom and pop grocery store that might be down the street. There's one or a very small number of owners, uh, and they don't. Their ownership is not traded amongst lots of people, and on some other things. The other extreme is a standard corporation. It's authorized by the government, and it involves having lots of different people potentially own portions of the business in the form of owning shares of stock in that business. And then, of course, there is a set of people who run the corporation on a day-to-day -day basis who may or may not be shareholders. Okay? So the ownership is very diffuse in many cases. And crucially, corporations almost always have what's called limited liability. Something goes wrong, the corporation can be sued, but the individual owners, the shareholders, cannot be sued. And that might mean that corporations take more risks in the kinds of activities they engage in than they would if you had a business that was owned and operated by an individual whose own wealth might be at risk if something went wrong. And how exactly are corporations taxed? So the simplest way to think about it is a corporation has some revenues from selling its product, and then it has some cost of producing that product. So we calculate revenue minus cost and call that profit. Okay? And then they owe a certain percentage of that profit, say 25% or 30% or some number like that. Now, it's messier in practice because you have to be careful about the timing of when the revenues came in. So it's not obvious that the revenues all which year they should be associated with. And even worse, you have to figure out what you count as a cost. And the law currently makes a distinction between things that you can expense, that you can count as cost immediately. Like if you bought some gasoline to put in the trucks that are in your you know, corporate vehicle fleet versus you did some investment, meaning you bought some equipment like a truck or a, a welding machine or something, or even more that you built a big building in which to house your, your activities. Those investments, depending on a particular country and the time period, et cetera, sometimes all of those expenses can be taken in a, in a year in which they happen. But more normally, you have to spread those over time. You have to depreciate those assets gradually. And that leads to a lot of complication and scope for sort of funny business. Now, isn't it the case that a corporation gets taxed for its profits and then it distributes dividends. And then the dividends, if I'm a shareholder, they also get taxed as well, correct? Exactly. So that's why people say that there is double taxation of the income that corporations generate. It's taxed first as though it was earned by the corporation. And then what's left over gets distributed to the shareholders in the form of dividends, and then they get taxed again because those dividends are treated as income under the personal income tax system to which people are subject. And if I sell my stock in case of a large gain, then I get taxed for capital gains, correct? And then you get taxed at capital gains, and that's even a slightly messier because the current tax code distinguishes short-term gains from long-term gains. If you sell within a year, and you pay a relatively high rate on those capital gains. If you hold for more than a year, you get a relatively low rate on the capital gains. So the bottom line is the same income is taxed multiple times. Correct. So if I've got a, a stock in Jeffrey Myron Corp, the profits are being taxed at the corporate level. Then I get my dividends. And, and they're, they're already reduced because of the taxation at the corporate level. Then I get taxed on the dividends. And then if I sell them, I get taxed for that. But people will say things like, you know, if I say I get a 10% capital gains tax, I don't know exactly what it is now. But when I sell that, my dividend, and they say, look, Leibowitz is paying less 
than a, a janitor would pay. But in reality, I've already paid on multiple levels. Correct. It would certainly not be valid to just compare the capital gains tax rate to the ordinary income tax rate because the capital gains, uh, the, the income from the corporation has already been taxed once before it gets to the shareholders. So how have corporate tax rates, well, I guess first, what is the origin of the corporate tax rate and how has it fluctuated throughout U.S. history? So taxation of income, whether personal income or corporate income, did not exist in the U.S., a couple of temporary exceptions that got ruled unconstitutional, but mainly did not exist in the U.S. until the beginning, early part of the 19th century. And then uh, it was created in 1909, but the Supreme Court didn't say that income taxes were okay. Uh, sorry, the 16th Amendment legitimizing income taxes didn't occur until 1916. So for a long time, the corporate income tax rate was zero. There was no corporate income tax rate. Then over a relatively short period, the tax rate in the U.S. went up in some years is a little over 50 percent. But the overall trend over the post-war period has been downward with very, lots of fluctuations because Congress is constantly tweaking at the margin. But now the rate is 21 percent, the federal corporate income tax rate. That's a big reduction since 2017 when it was reduced under the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Um, it was had been 35 percent. So we're now at 21 percent. And Donald Trump has said he wants to reduce it further. We'll see whether that happens under the new Congress. But it's plausible it might happen because Congress looks as though it's going to be totally Republican in both houses. Um, so the long term trend has been downward for the last 70 or so years. And it's relatively moderate at this point, still kind of in the middle of the distribution across rich countries. So you can find a few other high income countries that have lower rates, but you can find some that have higher rates as well. Of course, in the U.S., you would be subject to both federal and state corporate income tax rates in many states. So that bumps the U.S. effective rate up a bit. Although the state rates are not as high as the federal rate. Now, corporate taxes are not anemic where they have no negative effects or or just these wonderful benefits to the government and the, the people to whom they distribute benefits, right? How do corporate taxes affect production? So corporate taxes are going to reduce the after-tax returns okay, to the shareholders, to the people who could buy shares in the company. So that's going to tend to discourage people from wanting to invest in corporations. They would prefer uh, if corporate tax rates are high and their after-tax rates are low, therefore low, to invest their savings somewhere else, government bonds or assets in some other country that has lower corporate income tax rate and things like that. So you will tend to reduce production. You may tend to cause a corporation to raise its prices to try to offset the fact that its costs have been raised by the taxes. You may, in many cases, cause corporations to reduce the number of people they employ Okay, because there's going to be less demand for their product when their prices are higher. And one way a lot of these reactions to the corporate tax occur is by shifting location. So it's very easy to see if you're thinking about a given state that had a very high corporate income tax rate. Well, many, many businesses can easily locate in a broad variety of states. So you'll tend to locate in the states that have the lower state corporate income tax rates. Okay, and that's going to then reduce employment and reduce the income and reduce production in the states that had the high tax rates. But the same thing happens at an international level. If some countries have very high corporate income tax rates, many manufacturing activities and other activities that are selling their product around the world will simply locate in the countries that have the lowest corporate income tax rates, taking into account other factors, of course. A lot of people say things like, well, if you tax corporations, they're just going to pass the, the cost off to consumers. But it, it doesn't really work like that, does it? I mean, if they could charge more for their products, they would already be doing so. Why would they leave profits out you, you know, on the table when they could be reaping them already? The, but it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way in which prices would actually rise in that case is because with less money to invest, they would have to cut production, either cut employment or you know, some way, somehow, 
they're going to ha have to cut the amount of output. And by doing that, when you restrict the supply of something, then the price goes up. So it's actually that you would have less of a product, not that they're just saying we're going to arbitrarily charge more. Is that accurate? Exactly. Of course, corporations are, you can pick your language. Some people say they exhibit corporate greed. Other people, <laughs> economists just say they maximize profits. Of course, most corporations are trying to make a profit uh, and they will tend to set the price at the level they think maximizes that profit okay, for any given set of tax rates. Okay, if they could make it even higher, as you said, of course they would. If you then impose higher taxes, Okay, that's going to cause some of them to leave to go to some other state or country, depending on the specifics. Okay, and that reduced supply, as you said, means that the price will tend to be higher for those products. Okay, so yes, consumers will face higher products, but it's not that the company is making more profits. The company equilibrium in that location is simply responding to the reduced supply of the commodity produced by the corporations. Now, do corporations in terms of employment, because we always hear that small businesses are, are the drivers of employment, but corporations, I'm imagining, must employ a significant amount of people in the country, right? In terms of how where people are employed at a moment in time, of course, the big companies play a disproportionate role, a relatively small number of companies, because they have many, 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 many employee, more employees per company than mom and pop grocery stores or new startups in the tech sector or things like that. Now, in terms of job growth, people sometimes also say that small businesses are the engine of growth because they do a lot of the hiring. I think the right description is when a small startup turns out to be successful, then it in fact may exhibit very dramatic growth in the number of people it employs. Think about Apple Computer. 50 years ago, it had zero employees. It didn't exist. Now it has a zillion employees, similarly for Amazon or Microsoft or millions of other examples. But of course, zillions of small businesses don't succeed. Okay? They go out of business. So they do a lot of hiring aggregated over all the number of small business, but they do a lot of laying off or firing or letting people go because you know, they cease to exist. I, almost everybody probably knows places in their town or their city where there has been huge turnover of restaurants, okay, given, you know, and that, so that's the standard example. New restaurants come in, they hire some people, they're not, often not successful, and so they have to fire people lay, and, and lay people off. So it's just kind of irrelevant to ask who is creating the jobs Okay, the jobs will happen when there is demand for a product, then comp some companies, large and small, will come in to supply the product and hire people to help produce it. So it seems logical to me that when you're taxing corporations, they have less money to pay employees, you're going to have less employment. What do what does the empirical evidence actually indicate? I mean, when corporate tax rates go up, does it generally lead to a decrease in employment in the way that, say, an increase in the minimum wage does? There's a lot of evidence confirming what you just said. Now, people in particular want to ask, what is the incidence on the distribution of income by taxing corporations? I think the main argument people make doesn't really deny any of the negative things that we've been talking about, but people want to say a corporate income tax is good because it soaks the rich, okay, or it tends to fall disproportionately on high-income people who own all the stocks. And that's mislead, it's exaggerated for two main reasons. First, lots of people who are not rich own stocks through their pension plans, their 401ks and things like that. Okay? So is stock ownership positively correlated with income? Absolutely. But it's not just very rich people. There's lots of middle income and moderate income people who own stocks because of, of their retirement savings. But then second, as you just hinted, if you tax corporations, some of that impact will be on the owners of the corporation who may be disproportionately higher income, but some will be on the consumers of the product through the higher prices. Depending on what the product is, the consumers of the product might be very moderate or low income people, okay, because some patterns, the way that the pattern works out for some products. Okay, and the employees will have a range of incomes, of course, depending where they are in the corporation. But take the extreme case where a company closes down in a given location with a high corporate income tax rate and moves its 
uh, business overseas or to a different state or whatever. Then, of course, you cause a bunch of employees of a range of incomes to have no job rather than, and, and so you're going to have a, a negative impact on the distribution of income. So the evidence is that there's all of these effects saying exactly which one is bigger will depend on the details and the specific examples, but there's no clear case that we're improving the distribution of income uh, by taxing corporations. Now, you wrote that there should be no corporate tax at all. What's the argument for that? My argument is the following. First, we would avoid the double taxation of corporate income. We would still be taxing the capital gains of people who sell stock at a profit okay, if there were no corporate income tax. And we would still be taxing the dividends that would be paid out by corporations. Okay, But we would be taxing it as part of the personal income tax system. Okay, But... First, it would just be simpler world if we didn't have this second tax system. Second, having a corporate income tax, me, unless you did it in just the right way, is going to be complicated. It's going to have all sorts of rules about when you can depreciate this kind of asset, how long you have to take to depreciate other kinds of assets. And that means there's a lot of scope for a corporation to legally play games with its books in order to try to owe less tax, okay? But that means it's going to be harder for investors to figure out, is this a sensible company doing good things and making a lot of revenue relative to cost? Or are the books it's showing me messy in all sorts of ways So because it's trying to minimize its tax burden? There's no corporate income tax, that goes completely away. Investors can evaluate the profitability, the economic you know, pros and cons of corporations much more easily. Finally, and this is actually sort of one of my, I think one of the most important reasons, if you have a corporate income tax, it's almost inevitable that the political outcome will be that you define some activities as, as being allowed to organize as corporations, but being nonprofits and therefore owing no tax. Under the current US tax code, that's things like charities, religious organizations, educational things, um, research activity, lots of miscellaneous others. Okay? But then the government has to define what's a religion and what's not. It has to define what's an educational institution and what's not. And that puts the government in the position of having a huge form of political or thought control that is really just unnecessary in what I will call libertarian land with zero corporate income tax rate we never have to use the words for profit or not for profit. Every entity does what it wants to do. It generates some revenue. It generates some cost. The people who want to participate are free to do so in any direction. But we don't have the government defining who is a, a, a good thing that we allow to be a nonprofit and who is like an evil corporation that we call a for profit company and try to tax. And so that would all go away if we simply agreed not to have any corporate taxation at all. I'm 100% on board. I'd, <laughs> I'd get rid of all taxes and let people pay into the government what they want. The problem is the government has a massive amount of expenses. So what effect on the deficits and the, the overall national debt does this have if it's not accompanied by cuts in spending? For sure, if you reduce the corporate income tax or eliminate the corporate income tax, we have less revenue coming in and uh, in a short to medium term, and uh, that is going to increase the deficit. Now, it may be that we get some additional economic activity okay, as corporations from other countries decided to locate in the United States because of the lower corporate income tax rate. So there might be the, the, the total loss in revenue might not be quite as big as it appears at first glance, but still, let's assume that revenue goes down. So of course, if you're thinking about the overall government, you have to try to avoid having large and growing deficits forever. That will sooner or later blow up. It will have a fiscal crisis the way Greece did in 2009 and so on. But that's to economists, that's a separable question. We should try to think about the level of taxation and the structure of taxation as two distinct things. Ideally, we could get the populace to agree on a amount of spending that is affordable over the long haul. We don't have that in the United States right now. We have two programs in particular, Social Security and Medicare, that are growing so fast that if they keep going at their current rates, they will absolutely bankrupt the economy. 
So we have to do something about that, regardless of whether we change the corporate tax one way or the other. Okay? Assuming we do that, then the question is what structure of taxation would do the least damage in terms of the inefficiencies created? And my argument is that having a zero corporate tax would go in that direction. But you're totally right. If you just got rid of the corporate tax, you make the deficit bigger, and that's that's the problem. This reminds me of when I first started studying economics, I don't know, in 1999, I think, I was really taken in by the supply side argument that if you cut tax rates, you increase revenues. And there's some evidence that that indeed does happen. The problem is, it seems that Republicans, the advocates of the supply side, then use that as the sort of excuse, explicit or implied, not to cut spending. Because they say, oh, we don't need to cut spending because we're getting more revenues. But the the debt and the deficit grow even when the revenues go up because the spending increases beyond what the increased revenues are. As an, an economist, do you see any chance that government under any administration is actually going to give real spending cuts? I don't mean cut the growth rate where they say, okay, the, the projected rate of growth is 4% in spending, and they say, we cut it to two, those are spending cuts. I mean, real spending cuts, decreased dollar amounts going into uh, federal programs of, of whatever variety. Is there any evidence that that's going to happen or can happen? It doesn't seem to be at the moment. I would personally be delighted if they actually agreed, if they endorsed cutting the growth rate of spending. Well, it's better than nothing, right? Much better than nothing. And if the economy continues to grow at roughly its historical rate, you know, two to two and a half percent per year, okay, then, and spending doesn't grow any faster than that, then the deficit would be stable relative to GDP. You would not get this exploding debt relative to GDP. That would be maybe not perfect, but it would certainly be a huge improvement. It would avoid the fiscal crisis and all that. But both parties and almost every candidate and uh, politician from each party keeps saying, we will never cut a dime of Social Security or Medicare. And so that's just completely unsustainable. I think they all know that that can't happen, but they're just hoping that the crash comes after they're retired. It happens on somebody else's watch. So no, I think that's incredibly disheartening. That's the one thing, one as one thing that Harris and Trump agreed on completely, and they were both entirely wrong. But that means that politically, it's really hard to address that issue. Would you combine the elimination of the corporate tax rates with some deregulation. And again, real deregulation, not just cutting the growth rate of, of regulations, but cutting regulations. Do you think that that would have a significant, and I know significance a, a, a vague term, but uh, right now I think the, the economy grew under Trump at like 2.7% and uh, under Obama, I think at 2.6 or somewhere in that range. But if we were to cut the corporate tax rates, deregulate, largely deregulate the economy, do you think that we could get back to say 4% economic growth? No. I, I think that we look over a long period of history We've had periods with substantial increases in regulation. We've had some periods with scaling back of non-trivial amounts of regulation, you know, such as the airline industry and the trucking industry in the, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, if we look across countries, you can find some differences in how fast they grow as a function of regulation and tax rates and things. But the effects are really sort of small compared to the fiscal imbalance that the U.S. is facing. So... You could take the CBO's forecast of all these things, Congressional Budget Office's forecast, and you could assume a substantially higher growth rate for GDP for whatever reason, good luck or deregulation. or And you would have to make an assumption way outside the bounds of any historical period for it to change the basic fact that Social Security and Medicare are on a path to bankrupt the economy. So should we consider thoughtful deregulation? Of course. Should we consider a structure of the tax system that does less damage? Of course. But that by itself won't solve the expenditure problem. So until they really do something about the entitlements, we're not going to see explosive economic growth. That we're right. Otherwise. We're going to see the worst. We're going to see a fiscal crisis, which will certainly be quite bad for economic growth uh, in the short to medium term. Now, I want to ask you something that it's 
in the news right now, but I, I didn't tell you we were going to talk about it. So if you just <laughs> don't know the answer, that's fine. But there's a push, and I don't know how serious it is, but Ron Paul, the libertarian congressman, he wrote a book called End the Fed. And there are a, a, a lot of murmurings online from libertarians who either want to or believe they can pressure Donald Trump to either end the Fed or significantly reform it. Is that even in the remotest of possibilities? And is it even desirable? I think it's unlikely. But of course, we all thought it was unlikely that Donald Trump would be elected <laughs> president back as, in 2015. So, True. you know, surprising things do happen. That said, I don't think there's any good evidence that ending the Fed would make much difference to the performance of the U.S. economy. The simplest way to think about it is before 1914, the U.S. had no central bank. And that's when the Fed was created, it was 1914. And let's compare that to the period post-World War II. In between, I think there's pretty broad agreement amongst economists that the Fed made some mistakes and contributed to the Great Depression in a serious way. Okay, but let's give them a, a pass on that, say that was learning by doing. And, and, and okay, The average economic growth rate of the U.S. economy post-World War II under the Fed was a little bit higher than it was before 1914 when there was no Fed. The volatility of the economy is a little bit less a post-World War II under the Fed. So that doesn't make the case that ending the Fed would have any beneficial effects. Um, and I don't think there's clear, convincing arguments as to why the Fed is the major source of instability. There are times when the Fed may have contributed to some instability. Certainly, the big run-up inflation in 21-22 was probably partly due to the very expansive monetary policy the Fed ran. Okay, and they may may be well have overdone it okay, relative to sort of thoughtful criteria in terms of responding to the recession from, from COVID. But it still doesn't overall seem to have had a major effect on the path of GDP. So I think that's a, that, that's a pipe dream. I don't think there's any good reason to think that that would be a significant difference. Would it be the end of the world? No. I mean, in contrast to many economists, I think you can have an economy without a central bank that would function pretty well, too. But if anything, the record is consistent with the Fed making things a little bit better. Now, the Austrian economist and the objectivist in me would love to see a return to the, well, actually not even a return to the gold standard, an establishment of a real gold standard where that is the determinant of the amount of money in the economy. I know that's not going to happen, but I'm just curious if the Fed were to go and it was replaced with a real gold standard, do you think that would be a, a positive effect? I, again, I sort of come out in the middle compared to the mainstream economists. On the one hand, a lot of economists would just laugh at that idea and say it's it's been stupid, insane, et cetera, et cetera. But the evidence that I just described of the behavior of the U.S. economy before World War One, when we were on a gold standard, was incredibly healthy. I mean, U.S. GDP r rose year after year. There were some recessions, there were some financial crises, but the performance was overall really strong. The U.S. went from being a nothing country, a non-country in, say, 1790, to being the richest country in the world uh, on a per capita basis, uh, for sure, by uh, World War I. So gold standard is obviously not such a catastrophic or insane thing. On the other hand, the comparisons we talked about between pre-1914 and post-World War II also suggest that being on a fiat money standard and not having a gold standard is hardly catastrophic. It doesn't seem to correlate particularly with the overall economic performance. So I don't think it would make much difference. And a gold standard is still a big government thing. It's the government pegging a particular price. The government is pegging the price of gold instead of I mean, the government peg a different price, i.e. interest rates. But it's not as though one is pure laissez-faire and the other is not. They both are significant government intervention in the monetary system. So that also makes you think it's not obvious that why one should be dramatically better or worse than the other. All right. Is there anything that I, I didn't ask you about corporate taxes that I should have and just slipped my mind or uh, were never in my mind to begin with? Not that comes to my mind at the moment. I think we did a pretty good job. All right. So where can people find you? 
Uh, most easily my sub stack, which is just uh, libertarian called libertarian land. And I post there once or twice a week and raise issues like the issues that we just discussed. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. For now, this is the Rational Egoist signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Till next time.